Okay, so today we're gonna to be taking a look at the brand new Raven flagship in-ear headphone from Empire Ears. This is unbelievably expensive. It is extremely high-end. It is a 12 driver configuration here, and they call this a quad bridge because it uses four different driver types. Yeah, that's right, four, not three, <laughs> four. And in my view, there are a number of amazing things about this, but also some significant deal breakers, and I want to talk about that. So let's get into it. Now, for those who are wondering, this is a demo unit sent over by Empire Ears. Big thanks to Empire Ears for sending it in for review. Of course, they haven't paid me to say anything in particular about this, and all thoughts and opinions here are my own. Oh, and by the way, we now have merch up on headphones.com. There's a couple of fun ones there, but also this shirt is available. This We call it the Tangle T, uh, which I think is pretty cool. So check that out. Okay, so I want to begin here by talking about the price just a little bit. Now, this is just my opinion, but $3,600 is not something that any reasonable, sane human being should spend on a pair of in-ear headphones, on anything really headphone related. And I say that with the full recognition that audiophiles, myself included, are neither sane nor reasonable people. There is nothing about this product that has anything to do with value for money, right? That question is completely out of the picture here. And definitely this is not a headphone that is aiming for neutrality. This is much more of an editorialization of the music rather than about you know perfect transparency or anything like that. Um, so we will get into that in the moment, but uh, let me just talk a little bit about the accessories and some of the rest of what you get with this. Um, you do get a case. It's the hockey puck style case here. It's pretty nice. Um, no complaints there. You of course get a number of tips, you get a warranty card, a couple of other accessories, uh, and then you get this cable, which is, in my opinion, actually a very nice feeling cable. This one is terminated in Pentacon. I wish that at $3,600 companies would include some sort of adapter. Would have been nice to see. For the IEM itself, the shell design is very large. It's not uncomfortable though. I don't actually have any issues with comfort with this in my ears. Your mileage may vary. Uh, it's a, a very no-nonsense black design. I love it with this really classy looking kind of Norse mythology logo on the side. I guess that makes sense because the other one was named the Odin and this one's named the Raven. So you get the idea. The cable entry point is two pin. And this is where the first sort of weirdness shows up with this IEM, where the insertion point on the shell for the pins is actually a very snug fit and if the cable is removed incorrectly or with too much force, this can actually cause damage to the shell. So for anybody swapping cables around for whatever reason, you wanna be very careful with how you pull this out. And I recommend just kind of easing it out rather than trying to pull it at an angle. But I have also had IEMs on the flip side where the two pin cable just comes out too easily. So I suppose they were erring on the side of having it be very securely fastened in there. So that's just the choice that they made here. And the driver implementation here is another thing that is quite unique. Taking a look at the product page here, for the driver configuration, it's got two W9 Plus subwoofers, so that's dynamic drivers in the base, five balanced armature drivers, quad electrostatic tweeters, and a W10 bone conduction ultra driver. They also reference a proprietary multi-point SyncX crossover network. So they have their own unique driver tech, and these are not the same off-the-shelf drivers that you may see in many other IEMs that are out there. So now let's get into how this sounds. And I wanna to get to the good part here first. For all of the subjective audiophile traits, the descriptions of the experience, as I like to call it, the Empire Ears Raven is exceptional. So it is extremely detailed, as it's extremely punchy and dynamic for that sense of impact and physicality. Uh, especially in the bass, it is just monstrous <laughs> um, for the sort of soundstage immersiveness and, and spaciousness. Again, just fantastic. Where it suffers is in its tuning. Now for its overall wideband effects, the Raven's tuning is actually reasonable. It's better actually than some of the other ones that they've had in the past, but there are some fine grained quirks that are deal breakers for me and they may be for you as well. So let's talk about that now. Okay, so this is how the Raven measures on the BNK5 and 28. And just for reference here, the dotted line is uh, the target that we're using, and that is essentially a tilted diffuse field head-related transfer function of the measurement system. And uh, if you're interested in more information on this, we have you know tons of videos on that. I'll link one in the description for that. Now, uh, looking at the Raven, you can see that it is bass boosted. 
and uh, quite significantly, actually. And I like the way that it's handled here for the base boost over what they did with the Legend X. I found that with some of their other ones, the base shelf went a little bit too insane. And with this one, it is still boosted. It is still very strong and prominent base, but it is a little bit more reserved compared to those ones. Uh, then there's a couple of features and weirdnesses going on in the mids, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But then the other significant trait here is that it's quite withdrawn in the upper mids. It's very recessed up there, and you have a lower treble peak. Now, there are times when this lower treble emphasis isn't that noticeable, but because of its distance between, you know, where it's at and, you know, the rest of the, the upper mids and, and the mids, it does stand out. So the tuning here, while it's fun, it could be refined a little bit more. Now, I want to get to the more significant deal breaker, which is what's going on in the mids. You can see that there's a bit of a wibble going on here with, a, you know, a peak and then a dip. And this is just one seating. Let me just show you another seating here. And this isn't to do with channel matching or anything like that. This is just a different seating on the measurement rig. But uh, you can see with this seating, this mid-range feature shows up quite strongly as a peak. Now, there are a couple things that this resonance could be. One possibility is that it could be the bone conduction driver and the way that they've implemented that. Uh, but I want to show you guys on the gross here what this looks like because it doesn't always show up the same way. So here we are on the gross system and you can see this mid-range feature, this resonance showing up here again. But this is with a deep insertion for the IEM in the canal extension tube. When I use a shallow insertion, that feature basically goes away. So I'm very tolerant of the more relaxed upper mid-range presentation. You guys know that I'm, I'm actually kind of okay with that in IEMs. I don't mind it at all because it prevents that region from being you know shouty or overbearing. It's certainly not at all shouty or overbearing. Uh, this this IM is not. But for the lower treble presentation, it causes what I call percussion compression. It's this kind of emphasis to the lower treble harmonics that overshadows, you know, the rest of the the rest of the tones. It kind of compresses uh, percussive hits. It's, it makes cymbals sound uh, like they don't really ring out clearly the way that they should. Uh, and same thing with snare drums and hi-hats and things like that. Now, at the same time, I have to recognize that I am just one person, and maybe for other people that uh, effect isn't something that they're all that bothered by. And certainly I've talked to other people who've heard this IEM and this wasn't an issue at all. So it is very likely that I just have an extra sensitivity to this lower part of the treble. But the resonance in the mid-range, this is something where we could call this a measurement artifact. However, I hear this. Again, this is something that may not be the same for everybody as it is for me. But if it is, if it's for anybody else, that's going to be a big problem. And this resonance is very strong. In fact, when doing a sweep, like a, like a perceptual sweep, I hear this as well. This is an issue that's not that significant with music because there's a lot of stuff going on, but when you hear a single voice, it becomes a problem. Uh, it sounds like voices, the voices that you're listening to are coming from a stairwell. And so even though this isn't necessarily gonna be a deal breaker for everybody else out there, it's at least a deal breaker for me and it's gonna make it difficult to be used by a wide range of people uh, for a versatile uh, application. So let me briefly compare this to a number of other IEMs that are also super high-end and flagship compared to the Odin, which is another one of the really high-end ones that I've evaluated. The Odin is not as fun as the Raven in the sense of it's a little bit more reserved in the bass and maybe let's just say a little bit more balanced across the various different frequency ranges. Um, it also doesn't have that mid-range feature. With the U12T, it is that relaxed upper mid-range presentation that a lot of us love with a more U-shaped kind of, warm U-shaped kind of sound signature. Um, and it's maybe not quite as intense as this for the various sort of qualities of the experience that audiophiles love, right? But I will take its tonal balance over the Ravens uh, pretty much any day. And compared to the Empire Ears Odyssey, uh, which is actually a collaboration I think that they did, this is actually kind of similar in a sense, um, and I think that the the issues that I had with the Odyssey are similar to the ones that I have here. It really sort of grabs your attention with the sheer amount of resolution and detail and, and physicality and just all of those sort of, you know, audiophile qualities. But then the more you listen to them and the more time you spend with them, you start to realize there are some trade-offs in the the overall tonal balance and I think I think the same could be said about the Raven here it's basically the perfect example of like the highs and lows of what you can get in audio products it's like all of the crazy amazing qualities that audiophiles love combined with all of the weirdness and letdown and deal breakers that people looking for something a little bit more palatable for their day-to-day 
um, are going to have trouble with. And for me, that's why this is such a conflicted product and one that ultimately I can't recommend. Um, so the Raven, as much as it does a lot of really good things, and I applaud Empire Ears for trying to do something different. Uh, they're trying to not just they're not just making the same IEM over and over again, like you know, seemingly much of the rest of the industry is. This is one that I have a hard time with, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it's it's one I can't recommend. So that basically does it for this video. Once again, if you're interested in any of our written stuff, check out the audio files up on headphones.com. For additional measurements, those are posted in a forum thread link below. And if you wanna chat with me or any of the other folks who are on the Headphone Show editorial team, check out our Discord, that's linked below as well. And this is where you can tell me that I'm wrong on all of that good stuff. And that does it for me. I'll see you guys in the next one.